It's great to hear your good morning back to you. All right. Well, this morning, I have a sad tale to tell you. But I think it's best to allow King Solomon to tell it in the wise manner that he does. So listen up carefully. Follow my advice, my son. Always keep it in mind and stick to it. Obey me and live. Guard my words as your most precious possession. Write them down and also keep them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sweetheart. Make her a beloved member of your family. Let her hold you back from affairs with other women from listening to their flattery. So if you haven't guessed by now, this is a warning intended to lead to a pure life, not given to immorality. So how would the opposite direction be portrayed? Well, again, listen carefully. I was looking out the window of my house one day and saw a simple-minded lad, a young man lacking common sense walking at twilight down the street to the house of this wayward girl, a prostitute. She approached him saucy and pert and dressed seductively. She was the brash, coarse type, seen often in the streets and markets, soliciting at every corner for men to be her lovers. She put her arms around him and kissed him. And with a saucy look, she said, I was just coming to look for you, and here you are. Come home with me, and I'll fix you a wonderful dinner. And after that, well, my bed is spread with lovely colored sheets of finest linen imported from Egypt, perfumed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come on, let's take our fill of love until morning. For my husband is away on a long trip. He has taken a walk, wallet full of money with him and won't return for several days. So she seduced him with her pretty speech, her coaxing and her wheedling until he yielded to her. He couldn't resist her flattery. He followed her as an ox going to the butcher or as a deer that is trapped waiting to be killed with an arrow through its heart. He was as a bird, flying into a snare, not knowing the fate awaiting it there. What is the lesson to be learned here? I mean, this is a very sad tale. What's the lesson? Solomon continues, listen to me. Young men. And not only listen, but obey. Don't let your desires get out of hand. Don't let yourself think about her. Don't go near her. Stay away from where she walks, lest she tempt you and seduce you. For she has been the ruin of multitudes. A vast host of men have been her victims. If you want to find the road to hell, look for her house. What do these instructions sound like? Warnings against what? Pornography. That's what they sound like. Warnings against pornography which many men naively walk into. They sacrifice their lives for what? For just one look. They sacrifice their lives for that greedy desire, for something that they could obtain in a sinful way. <laughs> so the idea here is let us heed this warning. 
let us do everything in our power to heed this important report. So I'm going to ask Bob Cummins if you lead us in a word of prayer to begin the service. Well, let us, Bob. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy toward this family of faith. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we have as members of this congregation. We pray for all those who come out, and we pray for those who want to be here but can't. We thank you, Lord, for this great country where we have the freedom to come out and worship you. And as we go through this day, be with us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. The hymn we want to sing, uh, before we sing it, I want you to turn with me here to its number 597. 597. And I kind of picked it on the heels of what we just read because I think it makes a lot of sense for us. If you look at the hymn number 597. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord. Okay, so we're going to try and sing all these verses, all right? So join me in standing. Okay, let's sing.
became married when you were infants, right? <laughs> so you're 71 and 72 in age. That's true for me. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, what an accomplishment. That is so neat. 72 years. That makes me feel young. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Congratulations. What a, what a wonderful accomplishment. And then um, the bulletin board for the shoebox, keep checking it. There's always items on there to pick off. Thank you for the items that have come in today. Keep bringing those in. Uh, one thing I noticed, and my wife, which is coordinating this and everything, uh, we're realizing that, you know what, it's just a challenge in this economy to do what we're doing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I have confidence that some way, somehow, the Lord will make it possible, right? Mm -hmm. He will make it possible for us to do His will in the best way possible. So, okay, then the next announcement is Right Now Media. Kay, that's for you. She's, she's been following the announcements on Right Now Media on Wednesday. She, she picked my brain and said, I've watched everything you said, now what should we watch next? So I went looking and this is what I found. Okay, so right now media, it's Noah, the man, the ark, the flood, there's only four episodes. And it's very informative and you'll learn things about that time period and what happened that might surprise you. So again, right now media, you don't have the right now media, see me after and I'll help you get set up with it. Okay, it's a free service. Then the next thing you notice there, Bob Cummins has changed his phone number. Not on purpose. <laughs> so you couldn't find him. But he told me there's been some ongoing issues with the landline because I know some folks tried to call and weren't getting anywhere. And he told me last week, he said, they just can't get service. So this is the next best thing. And, and it's a cell phone. And it's correct, right, Bob? I wrote down the right number. It is correct. Yeah. However, okay. If you can't get me, don't try the mailbox because I have an 82-year-old problem with technical things. <laughs> 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 so right now, I don't have a mailbox set up, but you can text me. Okay, okay, there you go. So don't try and leave a message, okay? <laughs> but there, that's updated, so, you know, so we know Bob's number there is one of the leaders. And then if you notice the hurricane relief offering, a great thank you to those that gave generously. And uh, one of the leaders proposed uh, on last weekend that we also add something to it from the general fund, which we did. So it's a combination of your giving and the general fund uh, that we came up with that amount. So God bless you for being faithful. I know the Lord will do some amazing things in helping others. Okay, then, uh, Friday we called around for Bonnie's nephew, and I don't know how this happened, but I misspelled the name. It's Ethan with an E, not an A, okay, when we called that around. So, and on the prayer list, you can see I've got it still misspelled because I got it wrong. It's not A, it's an E at the very bottom. It's Ethan. But Bonnie said that his surgery on Friday went, was successful and everything went well. So thank you for the prayers. His mother, Bonnie's niece, was very appreciative. So the nephew is uh, a grandnephew, or I guess that's how you say it, when they're down there in the level, and you're the level of the grandparents. Okay, so, but anyways, uh, the surgery was successful. So thank you for praying. And then I got one prayer request I want to mention. Uh, Marilyn Warner's granddaughter, Katie, um, is pregnant. And that's good news. Uh, she just is newly married. How long has she been married now, Marilyn? Uh, two years. Two years. So not very long. And found out she's pregnant. And that was good news. But now she's having complications with the pregnancy. So there's a great need to pray for this situation because it is a severe complication that's going on. So I think that's all the information I have, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your kindness and your love and your presence here with us. 
we do give you praise for another year uh, to celebrate the anniversary of Charlie and Natalie. 72 years, what an amazing accomplishment in their lives of faithfulness and service. We would ask your great and bountiful blessings upon them this week as they celebrate this milestone in their marriage. We also, Lord, give you thanks for the successful surgery for Bonnie's nephew, Ethan. We're glad that he seems to be doing quite well. And then we do pray for Katie, uh, this granddaughter to Marilyn Warner, uh, going through a complication with her pregnancy. We would pray, Father, that you would intervene and, and help things to smooth out, and we would pray that uh, everything would work out safely. But we, again, we put her in your hands to do as you see best. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for our greeting hymn, we're going to go to number 601. Number 601. And uh, we'll sing through this twice, because it's pretty short. So join me in standing when you find your place, number 601, and we're going to sing through it twice. It's all right. I make mistakes, too. <clears throat> okay, try something else.
Jesus in Revelation 
with nothing negative to report about their conduct. But before we make this conclusion, we have to look at chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. So let's read that. <coughs> Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. It seems the apostle is expressing something in a very urgent manner. They should be growing more and more. But it seems they might not be as he had hoped for. The topic at hand involves living as a Christian should concerning whatever it might be and to be pleasing God in doing so. The commands of the Lord Jesus spoken of here are not suggestions which can be ignored. Jesus said, so why do you call me Lord when you won't obey me? But all those who come and listen and obey me are like a man who builds a house on a strong foundation laid upon the underlying rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm, for it is strongly built. But those who listen and don't obey are like a man who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it crumbles into a heap of ruins. You see, our Lord's commands are not intended to lessen our lives, as opposed to what some people might think, but to enrich our lives and to preserve our lives from the destructive choices that unbelievers make regularly. Sometimes in our childhood, we might have longed to do what others were doing. We look over here at a neighbor and we see them doing this. We look across the street and we see somebody doing this. And as children, we long to be doing what others are doing, only to learn later that what seemed fun turned out to be terribly destructive. If not for our loving parents, then we could have been swept away too. If not for our Lord's commands, then we could be destroyed too. Now, what is the issue at hand? It is the culture. The culture in which they live and its view of sexual practices as a Roman society. You see, in this society, the male head of a household could have a mistress or mistresses besides a wife at home. The pagan temples provided prostitutes involving males, females, and children to satisfy any sexual appetite. The boundaries in this society were non-existent for all types of sexual behavior. The Gentiles, which became Christians, had grown up in this society where everything is permissible. Now I think we can understand more clearly why Paul and his associates instructed these new believers as they did according to verses 1 and 2. Of course, we weren't there to hear his instruction to them in person. But I think he will repeat it for their sake and for ours. Let's go to verse 3. Look at his statement. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 
We often, as young believers, want to know God's will. On a laundry list of items in society, <laughs> usually we verbalize it in this manner. Is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? The answer to all of these questions is right here. God's will is for you and me to be sanctified. That's it. What does that mean? Well, here is what Paul wrote to another group living in Greece, like the people of Thessalonica. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his, and we would say his what? His own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So being sanctified means to be holy, not unholy, and not living at the lowest standard possible as a human being in the filth of sinful conduct. Peter, the apostle, explains how we can live sanctified lives in an unsanctified society. Here's what he writes. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So if I understand this right, these promises instruct us and equip us in how we can reject the base impulses of our sinful natures and live according to his divine nature within us. We are not slaves to the sinful nature forced to drink from this world's muddy stream of influence. Their society and our society promotes all sexual behavior as permissible. What is God's answer to this broad brush approach to sexual conduct? Well, it comes to us in three parts. And each part is introduced with the word that. So let's look at the first part right there in verse 3. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. The Greek word translated sexual immorality represents all sexual behavior outside the marriage boundary involving sexual images viewed to arouse lust and physical actions involving any form of sexual contact. If we live by the world's standard that everything is permissible, then we are not fulfilling the will of God for our lives. God's will for our lives is to live as free people, no longer enslaved to our sinful desires, which this world wants to stir up. Listen to this wise instruction directed to those living in the very capital of Roman society. Should we keep on sinning when we don't have to? For sin's power over us was broken when we became Christians and were baptized 
to become a part of Jesus Christ. Meaning, we're placed within him as a living part. Through his death, the power of your sinful nature was shattered. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. Meaning, we die with him. And when God the Father, with glorious power, brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. <laughs> Do not let sin control your puny body any longer. Do not give in to its sinful desires. Do not let any part of your bodies become tools of wickedness to be used for sinning. But give yourselves completely to God, every part of you, for you are back from death, and you want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for His good purposes. So in summary, we now live in Jesus. We died to sin with Him. We now have eternal life with Jesus in being alive from the dead. So therefore, he writes, sin never need again be your master. For now you are no longer tied to the law where sin enslaves you. But you are free under God's favor and mercy. You see, in summary, every don't in our fallen life would cause us to do this. I'm doing it, I'm doing it, and I don't care. Every time we heard the don't. For example, wet paint, don't touch it. Oh well, yeah, it is wet. That's the impact of sin upon us. Every don't was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Okay? But now, sin isn't in charge unless we give sin that position. That's the truth. So, here's the question. Now that we're in Christ, shall we abstain from sexual immorality? I agree, Gary. Yes. Well, let's go to the second part. Verse 4. And introduced by the word that. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust. So this part begins with, you know. Isn't that interesting? What should we know? Well, we all should know it's God's will for us to live in such a way that we possess our bodies instead of having them possess us. Do you understand the difference? We possess our bodies. Our bodies don't possess us. Well, what do you mean? Well, here's the apostle's explanation to another group living in Greece. Listen to what he says. In a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets first prize. So run your race to win. Now, Carson, does that make sense when you play football, you want to win? Lauren, does that make sense when you play soccer, you want to win? Laney, does that make sense when you play volleyball, you want to win? That's exactly what he's saying. Let's go on. To win the contest, you must deny yourself, yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or silver cup. But we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. So, I run straight to the coal with every purpose in every step. I fight to win. 
I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. So let me ask you a question. Carson, if in the game your teammates are not serious, are not giving it their all, how would that strike you? It would infuriate me. That's the point he's making. In the actual competition or in the preparation for it. So he says, like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit in order to stand aside. Or, in your games, you would be ordered to sit on the bench. Does anybody want to sit in the bench when the game is going? No. As a married man, I know what is holy. I know what is honorable in my conduct with my wife. I don't allow myself to do or to view anything which could be considered unholy or dishonorable concerning her. Here's what I call the Job Pledge of Purity. This was written a long time ago. In fact, in some cases, they say the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's old. Here's what Job said. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. For what has God above chosen for us? What is our inheritance from the Almighty on high. Now I know when you hear that, we might think, well, inheritance, uh, reward, but not according to Job. Well, then what is our inheritance? Here's his answer. Isn't it calamity for the wicked and misfortune for those who do evil? What he's saying is, it is to see evil punished. That's our inheritance as the followers of God. It is to see evil punished. And then he goes on to say, doesn't he see everything I do and every step I take? Have I lied to anyone? Or deceived anyone? Let God weigh me on the scales of justice, for he knows my integrity. So he's saying, my goal is to live with integrity in my life. If I have strayed from his pathway, or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or if I am guilty of any other sin, then let someone else eat the crops I have planted. Let all that I have planted be uprooted. If my heart has been seduced by a woman, or if I have lusted for my neighbor's wife, then let my wife serve another man. Let other men sleep with her. You know what he's saying? He's saying, let it be done to me what I have done. That's only fair. And then he says this. For lust is a shameful sin. A crime that should be punished. It is a fire that burns all the way to hell. It would wipe out everything. That is Job's pledge of purity. Can all of us take
take the pledge of purity as spoken by Job? And I will answer, we can. How? With God's help? Each day and long into the future? We can. Acting in an unholy or dishonorable manner in the sexual realm is typical of who? Well, look again at verse 5. And notice what he says right there. Like the Gentiles who do not know God. So what he's telling us there is this type of behavior is typical of the unsaved people to act in any manner to satisfy their uncontrollable passion for sexual pleasure. And why do they act this way? Are you ready? Why don't they act this way? They don't know God. Nor do they want to know Him. That's why they act this way. Should we be acting like unbelievers in any way, shape, or form involving our sexual desires? I think the answer is no. Listen again to the apostles' instruction to another group right there in the country of Greece. And so, dear brothers, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living sacrifice, holy, the kind he can accept. When you think of what he has done for you, is this too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. You see, knowing God is deeply satisfying. It is more satisfying than anything you can experience And knowing God is life-changing so that we don't have to look for satisfaction in the filth of this world's corrupting influence involving base human desires. I'm through with that because I find pleasure and joy in one place, God. And then what's the third part? Look at verse 6 again with the word that. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. The world's approach in the sexual realm is to take advantage of another human being in any way, shape, or form possible to get what they want. In doing this, they cheat and rob the individual involved of everything that makes them an image bearer of God the Creator. Because man is made in the image of who? Who? God. God. The image of God is being destroyed in another person through the use of sex in wicked images and in physical contact. Why is it that victims of sexual abuse suffer for years in trying to recover from such abuse? We know the answer. The image of God has been pulverized in. Misusing God's gift of sexual activity for selfish purposes not only destroys others, 
but it is self-destructive too. Listen to this wise instruction given by Paul. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. How does God view the misuse of a gift like sexual activity to injure and to hurt others? Look again at verse 6. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. So as I understand that, God doesn't look with favor upon any conduct that victimizes others by taking advantage of and cheating another human being. The world in which we live is filled with this type of conduct, especially where? Oh, you better believe in the sexual realm. Jude wrote, Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now let me ask you this question. Why do we have laws against the sexual abuse of others or even pornography involving certain Ages. Why do we have those laws in our society? Here's the Bible's answer. We know that the law is good when used correctly. Now listen carefully. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are kidnappers, liars, promise breakers, or do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. If I understand that right, the world is filled with people wanting to be sinful and depraved. And as Paul explains, God is the avenger of all sexual activities that make victims and destroy his image in them. And the apostle says further, we have warned you, and we have testified of this fact to all of you. What that means? No one can say, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. What's the conclusion of this topic? Look at verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Did God save us to leave us in the filth and depravity of sin for the remainder of our lives? What would you say? No. He didn't save us to leave us that way. Here's Peter's answer to this question. You must live as God's obedient children. 
Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. For my sake. Amen. Look at verse 8, our final verse. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Am I aware that certain people will oppose this teaching in the Bible? And my answer is, yes. yes. I remember a young man talking to me about an immoral situation involving him and a woman. I told him the truth. And he said, I thought this is what you would say. Then he went on his way with no intention of changing. The truth is, according to what Paul wrote, that young man had rejected God in his condition to continue as he was doing. You see, Jesus said, he who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Why has God given us the Holy Spirit? Here's the answer found in the book of Hebrews. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. So let me get this straight. The Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of us. So we have God's laws in our hearts and in our minds to do what with them? Is it to disobey and disregard them? No. It is to obey them. That's why he puts the truth inside us. So we will always have it with us and always obey. If we can reject God's law in the sexual realm, then it reveals this possibility about us. Peter explains it this way. There's an old saying that a dog comes back to what he has vomited. And a pig is washed only to come back and wallow in the mud again. This is the way it is with those who turn again to their sin. So we may not have the divine nature in us. We may only have the sinful nature in us. And so a pig does what? Goes back to the mud but if we are a child of God and we choose the wrong path, 
then we will be miserable as long as we live this way. David wrote about his failure in the sexual realm in this way. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was. But my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. All day, all night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord. And you forgive me. All my guilt is gone. Now I say that each believer should confess his sins to God when he is aware of them. While there is time to be forgiven. And judgment will not touch him. He does. It is a blessing to be living the way God wants us to, and it is pure misery not to. What is our current situation in this matter of the sexual realm as we have looked at it together? Are we living? as God wants us to, by possessing our bodies in sanctification and in honor. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we realize that this is a topic that we would never in a million years think of Paul discussing with the unbelievers living in Thessalonica. We would never think that something like this would be written in our Bibles. And yet, the truth is, the society in which those young believers lived in was as bad or as worse or as terrible as our society is concerning this topic. And we realize that as believers, we have to live your way if we want to enjoy our new life. If we want to have the joy of our salvation present in us, I realize and understand the temptations around us are great, just as it was for those believers in Thessalonica. As we examine our hearts and our souls, there could be among us somebody who is, who is trapped, trapped in this sin, in the sexual realm, needing to be delivered. And the answer is here, as we just read. There is deliverance. There is hope. As David said from his great failure in the sexual realm, I came to you and I asked for your forgiveness and I received it. And all my guilt is gone. That's the first step. It's to turn to you, confess what we've done and seek your forgiveness. And so I would pray, Father, here in this room, myself included, that you would forgive us if we fail, if we falter here in this way. That you renew our minds, renew our hearts, renew the way we live. That we would perfectly reflect the Lord Jesus Christ in this life. Thank you for giving us warnings like this. We give you glory, honor, and thanks in Jesus' name. new to me, but it's not new to us. Turn to number 603. I just learned this yesterday. So I think I know it. But maybe I don't. 
But anyways, I'm going to have Beth play it all the way through. It's number 603. I love the message of the hymn to go along with what we've been studying. So I'll let Beth play it through. We'll listen, and then we'll try it. I was at, <laughs> I got seven free books. This is one of the seven by the author that was actually there. The title of the book is called Fight Like a Man. I just finished reading the book this week, and it's all about keeping pure. And so I would say there's seven books like this one out in the hallway for, I'm going to say, men to pick up. And I would say that whether you are pure as the driven snow or struggling to stay that way, this is a book that would benefit anybody, any man. I just read it, okay? So there's seven out there, free to pick up. They didn't cost me anything, and I got them from the conference. Okay, so I'll have them in the hallway. Help yourself from that. Okay, Donald, if you do this in prayer, please. Bless our pastor, Lord, for the message that she's delivered to us today. And we come to you, Lord, we thank you for coming into our lives and being our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the love and compassion that you instill within us each and every day. And I ask, Lord, that you touch the souls of each person here today. Let them feel your presence and your love and compassion as they go into the community and share with others. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for being with us. In your name, Jesus, amen. 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 Amen